Welcome to the 13th episode of Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Today, our guest graduated ASIJ in 2004. He then went on to Columbia University, where he studied political science and Mandarin. He started his career in management consulting at PricewaterhouseCoopers in Hong Kong. He then joined Prudential PLC in their executive management training program with roles in Hong Kong and Taiwan. During his time at Prudential, he founded an English consulting startup, which he ran until 2014. Since 2013, he has worked as a management consultant and now product director for Ernst Young, based both in Hong Kong and currently New York. He was married last year in sunny Napa Valley, continues his high school interest in running, and currently resides with his husband and dog in New York. Welcome to the podcast, Max. Thank you, Nikki. Happy to be here. I want to start with, you know, chronologically and sort of go back to not quite as far back as ASIJ, but Columbia University, you get into this Ivy League college, and of all the possible things to study, you study political science and Mandarin. So as someone who also studied poli-sci, I'm very curious why you chose that route, and yeah, uh, why, why poli-sci? Why not business or accounting or other businessy things? That is a very good question. So I'll give you the answer that I got as a student and, um, and then maybe a qualifier afterwards. My academic advisor at the time recommended something that they were interested in because the chances that they score well in that topic are much higher. And so, you know, if people are going to a competitive school and they do well in the subject they selected, they can pretty much pick um, uh, many different industries or, or um, pursue many different job opportunities. So I took what you said at base value. You know, I, I um, academic advisor was largely correct. Um, and there were a number of different opportunities, including consulting, which we'll talk about a bit later. Um, however, I do recognize that the job market recently may, may value um, more specific skill sets that align with the industry. Um, maybe, maybe they look out for those a little bit more when combing through the um, large volume of CVs they get. Um, so that's kind of two sides to that, to that question that you raised, but that's why I chose policy. Interesting. And you studied Mandarin as well. So as early as college, uh, did you have China in mind as the next destination? Yeah, actually, so that was the, that was the, I would say the more tangible skill that I that I tried to, to leave college with versus the poli sci, no offense to our major. I did Mandarin because my university had a language requirement of two years minimum, and they had a summer program after freshman year that I could do. And I thought I would just get the requirement done you know, early by doing the, the summer program, which counted as a year, and, uh, and then one more year during my sophomore year. My parents said I could go to, to this program in Beijing, but I wasn't allowed to just drop the language um, after I got back. So I said, fair, whatever, I'll, I'll, I'll just do it. And um, yeah, I fell in love with the, um, the challenge of the language. I fell in love with the ability to more fully communicate with such a large a group of people that I was surrounded by on my, my time in Beijing. And basically I kind of decided to stick with the Mandarin and started doing internships in my, um, you know, sophomore summer, junior summer, and even studied abroad in Nanjing for my, for my junior spring semester. So it became, Nikki, it became more and more a, um, a goal, I think, throughout the four years of college. So by the time I was a senior, I knew that I wanted to get back to the Far East, both from that experience and also the positive experience I had you know, growing up in Japan. Uh, and that's what ultimately led to the idea of heading out to, to that region for work. You do Mandarin poli sci. You mentioned summer internships. How important were those summer internships towards getting a job? And sort of a follow up question to that. This is a question I get often from former students I have who are currently in college. Is they're looking for internships nowadays as freshmen and as sophomore, which that seems very different from when we, when we were in college. I remember junior year was a big thing. But what, was that the case? Maybe because uh, it was different in Colombia, but were people already doing internships freshman year, sophomore year? Yeah, this is, a, this is a phenomenon that's been increasing across multiple geographies that, I, that, I, that I've seen. So you're right. The focus was really the junior summer 
internship uh, when we were in college. Um, but I guess I'll answer your first question um, and then go to the next one about how early people start. I, I do think that the internships are really important, but not simply to throw on your resume um, as a resume building internship. I think it's equally important to test out areas that you think you might be interested in and learn that maybe they're not for you. I mean, a good example is um, I was able to experience a hotel management internship in Shanghai um, with the Four Seasons Hotel there. And very, very grateful um, to one of our, our, uh, our high school classmates for helping me um, you know, get my foot in the door for that opportunity. I, and I wasn't sure if it was a compliment or an insult, but they would say, oh, Max, you seem like you'd be a great hotel manager, right? Um, so I took it at face value and I'm like, well, why don't I go try it out, right? So it's not the typical time, like an investment banking internship or a tech internship or a consulting internship, but it was something that I genuinely was interested to find out more about and see if it was something that I would want to sink my teeth into. Um, so that's the answer to your first question, Nikki, around kind of how important are the internships. I, I think it's important not just to have a story to tell for your full-time intern, uh, your full-time interviews, but also um, figuring out what it is that you personally really enjoy or don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but your second question, yeah, so I, I have students uh, like mentees now um, or recent grads um, who have not only started internships, um, you know, freshman summer, but there's a phenomenon now where individuals will take off a year uh, of college in the middle, and then they'll do internships in the fall, the winter, the spring, and the summer. So they can hopefully both test out the waters for themselves, but of course also line their CV with a lot more work experience than they would have been able to do if they didn't take the year off. So it's happening. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, that is um, I'm not surprised, but it is just crazy to hear how competitive the landscape is becoming, not only for college admissions, but I guess when students are in college to get into these big companies, big firms. Um, thank God we went to college in an earlier time. <laughs> yes, yes. So you graduate Columbia, you go into consulting, sort of you've inferred to why, why Hong Kong. Um, what, what kept you in Hong Kong? Though? Were there ever times where there were offers to work elsewhere? And obviously Hong Kong is going through, you know, certain political strife at the moment. Has that impacted at all your decision in regards to continuing to work in Hong Kong? A couple, a couple ways to answer that. I think the reason Hong Kong was... I viewed it naively, but maybe relatively accurately. I, I viewed it when I was a senior that as a good balance between um, the you know proximity to China and the greater China market, but also balancing the um, you know presence of an international kind of business uh, work environment. I noticed in my internships, even at foreign companies in China, the, the, the management style was, was noticeably different from, from, from what the uh, management style was in these international companies' headquarters. So that's why I chose Hong Kong. It was a tough decision. I, um, I, I, tell, I tell some people about this. You know, I, I was deciding between uh, going into consulting, I had a couple offers there, and then also going into education. Um, so I was very fortunate to get an offer to join as a, an elementary school teacher at an international school in Hong Kong. And I was very passionate about, um, about the idea of teaching. And uh, you know, ultimately had to make that decision of, do I go down the business route first or down the educational route first um, in, in, in Hong Kong? And, and ultimately, as you know, chose the consulting route. But um, it, was, uh, it, it is still something that education remains close to my heart. And you know, the education, the English consultancy that I, I took a step at later on was, was um, so, so that was why I was looking at Hong Kong. The, um, I mean, Hong Kong was supposed to be just a stepping stone to Shanghai. Um, I fell in love with Shanghai during my internships. And the idea was to get a couple years under my belt in Hong Kong and then transfer or move to Shanghai. Life has its own plan, as we all know. 
And I did fall more and more in love with Hong Kong, the people, the energy, the opportunity. Um, so I stayed for a few, a few more years than I, than I originally thought. And it wasn't until I joined my second company, Prudential, where they, um, you know, they presented an opportunity for me to, to move not to Shanghai, but to Taiwan for, the, um, for one of the businesses that they have there. And um, I kind of got to, to try out that route, which is a bit different. But in terms of the... Um, so that's really intriguing that you almost joined education. So you almost joined us in the dark side. And uh, we missed out on you, though. Huh? You went the business route. Well, the idea, Nikki, is that maybe I'll be welcomed in the future once the business route has run its course. I hope there'll be some open arms. That would be amazing if we could have someone like you in the world of education, then maybe we can coach cross country together or something. And, you know, because you used to be, or maybe you still are quite an avid runner. Um, you were telling me the other day about how running affects your working. And if you want, maybe want to elaborate on that point, I know other um, industry leaders have written a bit about this. I think Dr. Fauci, who a lot of us have seen in the news recently, that guy runs like a thousand miles a day. Well, not literally, but he runs a lot basically. <laughs> so yeah, what's, what's the deal with, with running and um, people in the corporate world? So first of all, full transparency, there was definitely a, a, a dark chapter between the you know, high school running and turning it into a habit now. Um, so, so there, there was, there was a few years definitely where I, I didn't, I didn't do as much running as I should have. Um, I think where it came back was in Hong Kong, actually. So this does, this does take in tie with some of our earlier discussion. One of the wonderful aspects about Hong Kong as a city is its close proximity to so many amazing trails. And I personally, enjoy trail running more than road running um despite the fact that it's done a bit of a number on my body <laughs> so i got into the um the trail running space in hong kong and was ultimately able to get into a routine where i i wake up in the morning before work and do my runs um i wake up around 6 30 do my runs um you know, shower and then and then head off to work to get there um, on time by about between eight and eight thirty. Of course, the commute is less now with the current work from home environment. Um, so I, I think one of the things that I found to be quite useful was this this tip that came from probably some book, um, someone's methodology. But a colleague of mine from Prudential shared it with me, which is the whole you do something six months for six months. Excuse me you do it for six months consistently, it'll become a habit. Um, if you aren't able to maintain it for that long, the chances of you lapsing back to, um, to not doing that activity, whatever it might be, you know, is much higher. So I took that tidbit to heart uh, and I combined it with, um, in my previous relationship, agreeing with my, um, with my partner at the time to go to bed and wake up at the same time. That also was a really great big breakthrough because having different sleeping schedules made it a bit tough to pry yourself out of bed in the morning when someone else could just keep sleeping. So I think those two things, six months um, and uh, aligning sleeping schedules enabled me to, to get into the habit of, of running in the morning. And I'm thankful that up to now um, I've still been able to do that. Fewer mountains um, out here where we're based in New York. Um, but I still, I still do get out in the mornings. Do you feel like, um, I remember when I used to, uh, um, I say intern, but I was a mailboy at a law firm and they had this big gym. Do you feel like that is very unique to the American corporate culture? And, and was it like that at all in Hong Kong? Because from my experience in Japan, there was almost the inverse of that. Like it seemed like everyone who was very busy in the corporate world, like never worked out and you know never went to the gym whereas it seemed like um and even in that building i was working in it was in, in one of the maru bu buildings in uh, tokyo station I, you could see the inside of the gym you know as you walk past and it was almost always foreign 
like clients and like, or the foreigners that just happen to work in the building. So yeah, well, do, do you see a, a difference in culture there in, in the US in comparison to outside? Or do you see it evolving in other places as well? No, that's, that's a really good point. I actually had never thought about the differences in kind of the workout culture combined with the corporate culture in these different places. Um, you, your insight is, is, is much better than mine in, in, in Japan. I think if I think to Hong Kong, um, maybe that is a place uh, to your point just now where it is the mentality is starting to, to, to seep into some of the, um, the habits of, of folks from Hong Kong, not just the international people who, who travel there. It's maybe less so the in office gyms as it is the, um, the uh, kind of fancy gym chains that people go to near their offices. Um, and hopefully people won't be insulted if I say this, including my friends, but it seems like a bit of a, um, it's a place to be seen as well as to work out. Um, so it's, it's this, this kind of social dynamic as well as the health dynamic. Um, that comes together. It was called Pure Gym in Hong Kong. The equivalent in New York is called Equinox. Um, although full, full disclosure, I don't um, I don't have a gym membership, and I, I I didn't really have one in Hong Kong either because I would just go outside to run. So maybe from that particular perspective, I'm not the best person to uh, to speak to that. Do you feel like productivity is higher on days you run, and I, how do you how do you know? that your day is more productive? Like, is there any tangible ways one could measure that? The first, the first indication is I just feel so much better sitting down in the morning to start my day of work after I run. If I, you know, if I wake up and I, I, I feel off or if, um, if it's, you know, raining outside and I don't get to do my morning run, I feel sluggish. Um, I, I feel, you know, less energized and also, a tad kind of pessimistic or negative. <laughs> Whereas if I, uh, if I do my run, and even if I'm able to squeeze in slightly longer run on a day where a meeting starts a bit later in the morning, I feel incrementally that much better the extra K or two that I've been able to run. So I think that's one thing that is um, very noticeable. The other thing which, you know, you alluded to some other um, business leaders much, much more senior than myself who, who've spoken about their experience with running, including one of my, um, my bosses, my big bosses, I guess you would say, the, the U.S. chairman of, of Ernst & Young. Um, her name's Kelly, and she, she did a piece about her long runs, both on the weekdays and the weekends. And one of the things she mentions is around processing um, what she, you know, is going to go through that workday or maybe things that came out of prior workdays or, or meetings that she wanted to process and articulate a game plan for. I definitely feel the same thing. Um, when I'm on my runs, I can kind of, it's, it's not fully zoning out, but I can contextualize and take a step back to think about some of the things that maybe I was simply reacting to during a workday, um, but actually giving it some time and some space to process strategically how I want to go about it. I definitely found myself thinking uh, about these things during my runs. Um, so recently in the news, there was, um, well, not recently, just I think today, there was a very important case in the Supreme Court about um, discrimination in, in regards to hiring, in regards to uh, sex or sexual orientation, or the way one would identify themselves. And it was a landmark victory for the LGBTQ plus community. So while we're on, we're on this issue, um, you recently got married and... Um, off air, you told me a bit about sort of this thought process you had towards marriage because marriage was not legal in the United States till very, very recently. So if, if you don't mind sharing with me, what, what was it like, you know, growing up knowing that you couldn't get married? Yeah, that's a good question. So the concept of getting married, I had had in my head for a while, um, you know, the whole big wedding party and the legislation that was occurring in different countries led me to just assume when I had found someone I was ready to be married to, that we would find the country that felt right and had the appropriate legislation in place to support gay marriage. 
Um, so to your point, for a while, that did not include the US. It was places like South Africa, for example. Um, so it didn't really stress me out too much. I kind of just went ahead and imagined that we would figure it out, and my future partner and I would figure it out when the time came. Um, but of course, having a large country like the US pass that legislation, I think it was back in 2015, um, obviously was important, not just for ourselves, but for the whole community of LGBTQ plus to, to, to see that recognition um, and maybe reduce the need for, uh, there's a term, maybe I forget, like some sort of like um, gay marriage kind of tourism, having to go travel somewhere that's not your country to, uh, to get married. I've never heard of that. Gay marriage tourism, huh? That's, it's unfortunate. It it's was probably... a thing because not, yeah, not many countries were in support of it um, until until more recently. Wow! And then event, and then you meet um, your current husband at what what year? We met in 2017 in New York, and actually, the the quick story there is we were introduced by a um, ASIJ alum. Um, Michael Thornton. So I'm very, very thankful for Michael to introduce us. Uh, I was traveling to New York for work. I was still based in Hong Kong at the time and um, was traveling to New York uh, at least once a month and uh, met Alan through, uh, through, through these common friends. And we really hit it off and we got engaged in 2018 and married uh, last year, last summer. Well, congratulations on your marriage. Again, I know I said off air. And who proposed to who? So I proposed to Alan back in August of 2018. It was actually his birthday. We weren't sure who was gonna ask who. There's no rules, right? There's no, no tradition to follow. Um, so we could make our own tradition. We talked about it. Um, he caught me trying to measure his finger when he was sleeping. <laughs> um, and he kind of said, oh, make sure you give me your finger measurements too. <laughs> So we weren't sure who was going to ultimately get there first, but I surprised him on his birthday when he thought I was organizing some sort of birthday surprise. It turned out to be the engagement. That's, that's a great story. Although the, the trying to measure his finger while he's sleeping, I thought there would be maybe a more subtle way of getting his ring size. <laughs> I, I, was, I was open to ideas from friends, but it seemed like, it seemed like that would work. He seems to sleep very deeply, but apparently not. <laughs> so yeah that's that's a just a crazy journey you've had from you know yeah, we were also speaking off air how it's so normal now uh, at least in the united states the concept of gay marriage but even when we were in high school and college most states it, it was illegal was it difficult to to come out uh when you did and also when, when was that exactly and was there something that inspired you Something that gave you that extra push? Yeah, that's a good point. So did something inspire me? Um, I wish I could say, uh, like many people, wish that you know, their coming out story was with the love of their life at their side and doing it together, telling parents and everything. But the, um, I think the inspiration for, for me was I had a bit of a rough sophomore year in college and uh, I had to move my dorm. Um, it was partially related to some of my own journey of figuring out who I was. And to be fair to New York City and to Columbia as a university, very liberal, very open. It was the first time I had experienced the concept that being gay was kind of hip. Like it just, it wasn't, it was not even not a thing. It seemed like, you know, it was like a lot of cool people slash concepts were derived from this concept of being gay. So it was, it was a lot for me to take in coming off the plane from Tokyo and a, a lot to digest. So it was definitely a supportive environment. But after having a bumpy sophomore year, um, I felt like I owed it to my parents to explain what the heck was going on, why I had to move dorms, all that good stuff. And, uh, and that's, when I, that's when I told them, was the, the summer after my sophomore year. And, and they were both very, they were very supportive and, um, you know, they, 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 were, they were really interested in making sure that I was going to be safe and was going to be not, like, not discriminated against. F funny enough, or maybe it's not funny, but a coincidence that one of the concerns that they shared with me was the threat of being discriminated, for example, at work, 
right? And not being able to progress in my career. And, and the ruling that you brought, brought up just, just in the last 24 hours, you know, speaks directly to the, um, you know, le legislation to protect against workplace discrimination. So, uh, you know, it was, it was definitely a, um, it was definitely uh, a coming out experience was, was one that I experienced a lot of support, both from family and friends. And that was during college. It's, it's, it's good. It's good to know that things seem to be always improving. But there is definitely still ways to go. Huh? And I, don't, I mean, I, I'm just I'm conscious of your questions at the beginning around mm -hmm. major and your comments about students. I know you, it's t top of your mind, right? With all mm -hmm. um, your, you know, your students that you teach and, and many going off into college. I, I feel like there's something that I do like to mention around deciding on a major and deciding what work to go into that somewhere in between my freshman year and my senior year of college, I missed the opportunity to connect something like my interest in cars and my um, academic background to apply to jobs in the auto industry. Like, mm -hmm. why was that not an option? And I, I just try to remind folks who are going through that journey now that it's important to keep in mind that you don't have to just go into the predefined routes of consulting, tech, banking, law, or medicine, right? There are, there are other fantastic opportunities that even if the majority of your classmates are going into those specific fields, it doesn't mean that you can't combine your academic background and your interests to set yourself down a course of something that aligns more with your with your passions or with your um, kind of subject matter interests. So as we wrap up this conversation, um, I like at the end to have our guests speak for just a few minutes in regards to what's to come in their lives for the next few days, next few months, next few years. Uh, so yeah, please update us with your life, Max Taffel. Sounds good. So next few days, uh, Alan and I are moving our things out of our New York City apartment to temporarily stay at our country home upstate while the pandemic takes its course. Um, in the next few months, I hope that we are able to return to the city. The city has opened up and that our respective offices has, have also opened up. Um, and the next few years, uh, you mentioned earlier already, Nikki, the, um, the idea of adopting a child or two is an exciting prospect. So lot, lots to come. It's very exciting to hear. And um, maybe one day we can run again. Um, Max was my captain for cross country, so maybe we can competitively run. It'll be 20 years later, so 2024. Let's try to stay there you go. for that. I don't know how competitive. I'm not as fast as you, Nikki, so it may not be much of a competition for you, but I look forward to that. I think, I think we can do a 1K, maybe, maybe 2K. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Th thank you for being on. And uh, yeah, I'll see you around. Bye. No, thank, thank you. I appreciate it. Take care.